My topic today is on performance and scalability, and not so much talking about the ugly stepsister that uh, none of us want to talk about being uh, stability. I've spent the better past, part of the last 18 years of my career facing the most complex performance and scalability problems that I could find across our customer base. And uh, as humans, we're wired to learn through pain. And uh, as a lighty, my mother tells me that um, my, I sit on the far end of that pendulum swing, often needing a lot of pain to learn. And uh, she got tired, she tells me, when I was young, of telling me not to touch the hot stove plate. And eventually, she had to let me touch it in a controlled fashion to learn my lesson. And she says that after that, I learned my lesson pretty quickly. I wish I could say that uh, years back when I was younger in my career, I sat in a talk like this, hearing about scalability and performance of systems, and that's how I learned. But no, uh, that's not where my journey into it began. Contrary to popular belief, most of our modern technologies don't tend to behave in a way where your performance degrades gradually as the load increases and your user base can actually carry on working on the system just with a degraded experience. Actually, um, most of our modern technologies tend to behave more like a cliff that you fall off of. And uh, unfortunately, this is where my journey into performance and scalability uh, started. And it was in probably about 18 years ago, we were building a very large CRM type system for Vodacom, one of our large telco clients in SA. And this system was quite large. By the time we were done, we had probably well over a thousand web-based screens in the system, needed to scale to tens of thousands of very active users. And by the time we had eventually solved all the problems and got there, the service, services cluster, server side, was running at, in the region of about 6,000 requests per second. And at that point in time, our main database was running in the region of about 30,000 SQL requests per second. Gives you a bit of a sense of the, the scale that we had to get to in terms of load on that system. I have spent my career as that typical engineer that was always called into the war room when our systems went down. And uh, I've always been that senior engineer in that war room situation, trying to understand what's gone on and trying to restore service. And uh, oddly enough, actually, I've always enjoyed my experiences in a war room. Uh, there's something about it I enjoy, and I, I love chasing down the problem, figuring out how to restore service and getting it done. But I can promise you, you don't want to be that senior engineer in the war room situation where your system's gone down because you can't handle the load. It's tends to create a condition I call the raging herd. And it's that concept of there's all this load coming and your system's gone down and so the gate has swung closed. And you have this raging herd getting quite agitated at the gate, trying to log into the system. And if you couldn't handle the load on your steady state peak load, I can tell you now you're not going to handle the raging herd load when you restore service. And uh, so the, the gate swings open, that herd comes through very aggressively, much higher loads than the steady state peak load, and you go down again. So in these days in Vodacom, we started having prolonged outages. We would go down sort of early into the morning as the load peaked, we would go down and we were down for most of the day. And we would only be able to restore service late in the afternoon when the load naturally just dropped off enough. And, uh, we couldn't even sleep those nights because we knew we had, we had fixed nothing substantial and we knew the load was coming back in hot the next morning. Performance and scalability is quite a broad topic, really, according to the nuance of the type of system. So from systems like large data processing to maybe streaming, TPU intensive type systems. And uh, Tony tells me I've only got about four hours of your time today, and I think I can only hold your attention spans for probably about 10 minutes at a time. So I'm going to limit the discussion today to very much large front-end based systems or transaction processing type systems, because they tend to behave in a very similar way and very much to the server side load of those systems, high scalability on the server side load of those types of systems. Before we get into some of the detail, let me 
dispel some of the myths. And certainly when I was younger, I used to believe some of the same stuff as well. The first myth is, oh, okay, we, we've got a well-structured project. We've got really good people working on it. We're going to develop the system according to best practice. We're going to throw it across the fence to a performance testing person who will performance test it. And if it doesn't scale to the right load, we will just add more server instances and we'll be good. The next myth, and I hear this one fairly often as well, is, oh, we just dependent on that upgrade. If we get that upgrade to the new version of the database or the new version of the operating system, there's a whole bunch of performance optimizations in that upgrade, and then we're going to be good. Next one, and I've heard this many times. Uh, in those days, it was, oh, OK, Java is too slow. Uh, if, if we had just used C, C++ to develop it, we would have been OK. Or the new one, if we were just running JavaScript in Node, it's much faster. I can tell you all, these techs, even the old ones, were optimized and developed to handle far higher loads and performance than any of us in this room are ever going to need. And then the new kid on the block, and I keep hearing this one too, Ah, if we were microservices architecture running in cloud with uh, EKS auto-scaling, it would just automatically scale up in cloud, and uh, that would solve all of our problems. My Vodacom horror story earlier on, we had already done all of this. We had increased the number of server instances. We had thrown a huge amount more CPU at the problem. We had increased our memory, our network. What was uh, quite evident to us is we were already running on the most expensive server hardware that money could buy in those days. I think it was about 50 million Rand for a single server. In today's terms, that would be well over 100 million Rand or close to $8 million for a single server. Huge number of CPUs, fastest network topology that you could get in those days. And the, the second thing that was quite obvious to all of us is when we were going down under load, the server wasn't even blinking. We, we used to joke that the server didn't even really know our application was running. The CPU was idling along. We had plenty of spare network capacity. We had no issues on our hardware. What we learned in those days, and I've seen it numerous times in the decades since, the vast majority of performance and scalability problems comes down to our designs and our code. So uh, developers in the room, listen up here to uh, some of what I have to say today. The problem is you. Performance scalability really does come down to a limited resource paradigm and a bottleneck paradigm and uh, helps to just quickly take a checkpoint on the common limited resources. Some of them are top of mind for us always. The server, typical um, CPU, memory, network, we all know about this one. Network context, we all know about bandwidth, limited bandwidth and latency concepts. What a lot of us often forget about is behind the network, there's various limited resources that we need to be mindful of. Things like routers, firewalls, DNS servers, load balancers. Then databases, we're all quite aware of performance problems out of databases, and they really are brilliant at what they do, but we need to be thinking of them as a limited resource and quite cognizant of conserving those resources. Then the next one, threads. Most of our modern techs are thread-based. Threads are quite heavy, as we know. You cannot think of threads as an unlimited resource, thinking you're just going to span up to thousands of threads in your system. This one we're all quite familiar with. When we're doing caching, we are quite aware we've got to conserve memory within those caches. This one we're not always mindful of. The technologies we've chosen and the frameworks we've chosen, they are typically very good for what they were designed to do. And uh, they have been optimized to be highly performant and to scale. But if we're not using them according to their best practice paradigms, and we're not using them for what they were intended to be used for, typically, by my experience, it's going to jump up and bite us in the butt. Cryptography. We very much know it's quite CPU intensive. And so we're we often thinking along those lines. What we sometimes forget is that cryptography is dependent on random number generation, which is dependent on a resource called entropy. Entropy, highly dependent on the server architecture and the operating system architecture we're running on. 
And something to take note of is Linux is particularly fragile in terms of its ability to generate entropy at a fast enough rate. And then the last one, and I've put it here specifically, anytime we are connecting to a remote device, a remote service, maybe calling another service, we are using connections and connections are very heavy. You need to conserve them. You cannot just keep spinning up more and more and more connections to your downstreams. So now that we know that it's a limited resource paradigm, it tends to help to step back and get a little bit of perspective of the who should pay attention and how should we go about the approach of paying attention. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the thing I've seen again and again is no program, no matter how well it's structured as a large scale program, scaled agile or not, even old style waterfall program management is ever going to get you there. It really does come down to senior engineers and principal engineers being involved through the full life cycle and involved in prod. So stay, stay involved and intricately involved in the design for scale, build it for scale, test it with a purpose for scale. And then very much when you're in production, take an SRE type approach to owning that system and ironing out all further issues. And then the how to go about it. I've realized that there's two repeating formulas, if you will, that uh, tend to guide our efforts. The first of the formulas, and it's fairly obvious to a lot of us, is the inverse relationship between performance and scalability. Put simply, if the code is executing lightning fast, it will scale. If it's not fast, it will not scale. And there's no way around this. The second one is actually the Pareto principle, or more commonly known as the 80-20 principle. If you do very large scale front ends, it becomes quite obvious if you've maybe got a thousand screens that 20% of those screens account for almost all of the active daily usage of that front end system. And the other 80% of the screens are hardly ever used. And the same applies into the service, server side clusters for those systems. And so I've noticed that almost no matter what the system I look at, if I take a look, there's 80% of the services running server side that the system uses, they take almost irrelevant load. And then there's 20% of that, of the services on your server cluster that make up just about all of the load for that system. The 20% is where you need to be focusing. Just to illustrate how these two play out, this is a screenshot of production system where I've just taken a set of services in a domain and expanded it out. And you can see the vertical blue box. I've highlighted the load on those services. And you can see the typical 80-20 principle, the first handful of services making up just about all of the load, and then it drops off rapidly. And then the horizontal blue box highlights the first principle or the first formula, which is if you look at the, the top three or four, very fast average performance, two milliseconds odd average performance, one millisecond. The, the next one, even sub milliseconds average performance. Then you suddenly see one jumping out at 147 milliseconds average performance under load. That service will not scale. And so the combination of these two really do bring focus as to what we've got to worry about. The 80% of the services in your system, you can forget about them. They are not really going to be material in your scalability. You need to hunt these down. Then the other thing to just understand on this 80-20 principle is it tends to be recursive. So forget about the 80%, focus on the 20. Then apply the 80-20 again to it, and you're going to see the same pattern. 20% of those make up a disproportionately higher load and need to subscribe to a higher performance criteria. How do we fix them? I've noticed it pretty much for these systems comes down to four common patterns that we use to fix the problems. And uh, interestingly enough, they tend to behave a lot like plumbing. You've got a cross section of a pipe and there's a big volume of water coming down this pipe and uh, the pipe is not thick enough. You don't have enough proverbial CPU or memory or network. Well, one of the solutions is get a bigger pipe. And uh, so these four plumbing concepts actually is uh, how we tend to go about solving them. And I'm going to start with the least recently, I mean, the, the least likely used pattern through to the most common pattern that comes into play. First pattern is actually where you're introducing an intentional bottleneck. 
And it's very seldom applicable to these types of systems. But in effect, what you're looking for in this pattern is through the bottleneck to smooth out your load or to slow down your load intentionally. And uh, I've mentioned the raging herd. This, is, this pattern is applicable to dealing with raging herd. The next pattern is the scale up. So in plumbing terms, it would be get a big thick pipe. And now you can handle the volume of water that you need to through this pipe. In server terms, we all know about it. Get a, get a bigger server or a server with faster CPU. This pattern is sometimes applicable, but the pattern that's more applicable more often to our modern technologies is the scale out. In server terms, we're quite familiar with it of scale out the number of servers and load balance against across those servers. In new cloud terms, you, you spin out more and more pods for particular services according to the load on those pods. In other resource concepts, sometimes we call it parallel processing or, in certain cases, possibly multiplexing. They're all the same pattern of process in parallel. And uh, in plumbing terms, it would be like adding multiple smaller or thinner pipes in parallel and channeling the water concurrently through those pipes. Then the most applicable pattern, and really this is the, the go-to always, is make it more efficient. Improve your code, design your code to be less onerous on the resources that it's using, and uh, design your code to run faster. And by my experience, this is the pattern, again, probably 95% of the time when I've experienced systems that aren't scaling, this is the go-to pattern. So I suppose what I've been saying is that I've spent the last 18 years becoming an exceptionally well-paid plumber. What are the design principles that I've learned over the years and that all of us in the room need to be quite cognizant of if you know you need to scale your system to very high concurrent loads? The first of these is use standard technologies. So if you stick to the tried and tested technologies of the day, I can promise you they're highly optimized for handling very high loads and to be highly performant. But within those standard technologies, very much stick to the best practice usage of those. Don't stray into using the technology for what it wasn't intended for. And the second thing here is don't reinvent the wheels. All of these techs have their standard cross-cutting concerns and ways of doing certain things. So whether you're talking caching or authentication, authorization concepts, logging, monitoring, if you're sticking with those best practice cross-cutting concerns and you're not reinventing wheels, you are generally going to be OK. If you pick bleeding edge technology that's not yet been matured, it's got the name bleeding edge for a reason. And uh, I've been there, done that, and burnt that t-shirt. The nature of bleeding edge technologies that have just launched is these kinks haven't been ironed out. They do have problems associated to them. And if you are one of the early adopters of those and you're in a system that needs to scale to very high concurrent loads, you're going to be in trouble. Next design principle is cash aggressively. Uh, just to put this into some context, years back at Vodacom, we had a production problem where our production cash cluster seemed to be degrading under load. And it was a, a bit bizarre to us, and we were battling to figure it out. And eventually, on a long weekend, I think it was an Easter weekend, we got permission to take the offline production cash cluster and load test it to try and replicate the problem. And during that weekend, we load tested that cache up to 8 million requests per second. This gives you a bit of a sense of what these modern caches can do. And uh, as an engineer, if you think you're going to get your database to scale to that sort of level without a cache, good luck. Next principle, stateless. And it's, it's a common terminology that we talk of. I personally believe that stateless is a bit of a misnomer or a fallacy. If you're uh, going stateless, all you're doing is you're assuming someone downstream from yourself is going to manage the state for you and hopefully scale. But the principle is still really valid. The principle to me is absolutely minimize your use of state. If you think you need to have state in your system or in your design, think again. Find a way around not having that state. And then when you get to that ultimate decision of, OK, you have to have state, that's a really key bottleneck in your system that you've got to um, design very well 
and understand whether your design is going to scale to the concurrent load. Next principle I've learned through pain, don't use disk. No matter what disk you've got and how fast you think it is, it will not scale to the server-side loads needed if you're repetitively using disk. To give you an example, and this, this one here is a screenshot out of Dynatrace and uh, shows the case. It happens to be a, a problem I've seen repeatedly numerous times through the decades. Actually, interestingly enough, just last week, one of our banking customers called me for help. They had a pre performance problem that was intermittent that they couldn't figure out. And I went in, and it turned out to be this exact scenario again. It's a, a common problem in Java technologies where developers are having to call a remote system through a web service. They're looking up the web service definition out of the code, which is correct. But the way they're instantiating the web service class they're not doing it with a static. And as a result, unbeknownst to them, they're throwing away the instantiation every time. And under the covers, they don't realize that repetitively every call is going to disk to fetch it. And you can see uh, highlighted in the, the horizontal red box, just degrading under load, and those services are not scaling. Next principle, be quite mindful in your design of the fan out or cascading consequences of your service aggregation pattern. Service aggregation in these types of systems is a good pattern. So typically, you've got a, a call coming in from the front end. That service is maybe doing three or four calls to other services. And those services each are maybe doing five or 10 calls to a database. Very quickly gets out of hand where a call from the front end is resulting in maybe 20, 30, 40 calls to a database and is not going to scale. Another example on the screen here. And this example happens to be a pattern where the developers have used Hibernate. Hibernate's a common ORM in the Java world. And I personally have come to realize that ORMs in general are an anti-pattern if you want to scale. They add massive other value, and that's undisputed. But for scaling systems, the behaviors that ORMs have towards the database and that developers are usually unaware of are killer. You can see this particular example front-end request coming in and very quickly results in 186 separate calls to the database. Developers didn't even know this was happening because they've used an ORM and uh, they made a couple of mistakes in the usage of the Hibernate. Next principle is avoid old things like myself. And uh, what I'm referring to here is legacy systems. Don't integrate to legacy systems if you need to scale. And, uh, you in this room and I know that that's not really pragmatic in the types of systems we develop. Invariably, you have to integrate to legacy systems. And so the principle is be quite mindful of that legacy system, very unlikely to scale to the sort of loads you need and might on top of that be quite fragile. So the principle here is protect that legacy system from yourself as a raging herd. And the way you do that is be quite careful on your configuration of your connection pools. The tendency to just put up connection pools to very high levels is going to push that legacy system over the proverbial cliff. When they go down, you're going to go down. In South African terms, we're quite familiar with that when you've got something old and it hasn't been maintained very well, we end up with a concept of load shedding. And uh, the interesting thing is one of the solutions to an old legacy system that hasn't been maintained very well and is a little bit fragile happens to be a pattern called circuit breaker pattern. Circuit breaker pattern was popularized by Netflix a bunch of years back when they outsourced their Hysterix model as open source. But uh, many of us have been using circuit breaker pattern for decades already. If you have a fragile legacy system that is prone to degrading under load and is fragile, circuit breaker pattern is the right one to be using. Next principle is uh, software engineers. Pay attention to your SQL performance. Most SQL devel most developers I come across in the industry, and including in BBD, unfortunately, have no comprehension for what looks good on SQL performance. Up on the screen here, you'll see each of these is a SQL. They are very complex SQLs on a production system. Running across, joins across numerous tables, and these tables have huge data in them over a billion rows. You can see highlighted in the vertical red box 
blue box is where the where it's showing the average performance of each of these queries under load. And if you go down the list, you'll see three milliseconds average, two milliseconds average. Interestingly, low down the list, you'll see an insert into an audit table. Just by nature of that table, we're running at a very high concurrent insert rate into that audit table. You'll see the performance of that insert as experienced from the application running at an average of 3.44 milliseconds. Developers in the room, that's what good SQL looks like. If you've written SQL and you're getting 50 millisecond average performance or 20 millisecond average performance and you're celebrating, you're misguided. This is what you need to be achieving. If you're not on any of these modern relational databases, it means you've designed your database wrong or you've written your queries wrong and you haven't paid attention. Next, next uh, design principle is pay attention to the pooling concepts in your technology. Whenever you see a pool, it is inherently there to get over the lazy load or slow initialization periods of resources. And it's there as a mechanism to allow you as an engineer, as a developer, to make highly efficient usage of that resource. Principles for pools. Don't think of it as unlimited. Don't just scale up the pool size to, to huge values. And then the second principle with it is the, what I call the just-in-time resource principle. Don't fetch a resource out of the pool if you're not going to use it and use it fast and release it quickly. The typical paradigm and that us as developers are quite familiar with is maybe you're doing some database work. Then you need to call a remote system. And afterwards, you've got to finish off with maybe some updates to the database and return. If in your design, you're able to do the, the legacy system call or the remote call first, and then fetch a database connection, do all your DB work, commit, and return that connection to pool, that's the better design. This principle, we're all quite familiar with it, which is don't process large amounts of data server side. If, as a developer, you think you're going to fetch a couple of hundred rows out of the database, you are misguided. The system will not scale. Your design is wrong. Same applies to other forms of data. If you're sitting with collections or arrays in memory that have a huge amount of data and you think you're going to be churning through the, that data under load, think again. And the common one we're familiar with is requests and response sizes. Keep them small. This principle uh, certainly wasn't intuitive to me. This one I learned through pain, and I've seen it numerous times. It comes down to exception handling. Generally, exception handling, as we know, is quite an onerous thing. We're often fetching a stack trace. It's quite large in itself, and we're passing it around. And the principle here is a term I've given it, um, which is exception floods. There are roughly three scenarios in these types of systems under which you can end up with an exception flood. The common one is actually user behavior. If you've got an exception you're throwing to your customer base, your user base at the front end, they get that response pretty quickly, they get annoyed, and they start aggressively retrying. And I've seen scenarios where the exception flood from that generated server side actually was the load that pushed us over the cliff. We couldn't handle the rate of exceptions in the way we were dealing with exceptions. Are the two common ways that you can get exception floods. The, the next is an anti-pattern. That's where developers have put in an auto retry on exception. Developers, it's a bad practice. Don't do it. If you have to do it, then put in the right pattern, which is typically a back off time between and that typical fallout um, loop after two or three retries so that it can't in itself get hundreds of threads in the same loop. And then the third cause is actually the circuit breaker pattern itself is often an, results in an unintended consequence that you didn't think of, that the user behavior of a circuit breaker pattern is they're going to click again. And so be mindful of all of those and be mindful of whether you can scale to high rates to handle exception floods. Next one is blocking and locking contention. All of our techs, as I said, are multi-threaded techs. By nature, when you've got a multi-threaded tech, you do have under the covers locking or blocking. Developers, the, the key word to, to tuck away is um, thread safe. Anytime you are thinking in your design, you need to use a thread safe version of a class, maybe thread safe array as an example. 
understand under the covers there is locking contention. If you're going to have a very high rate of threads using that class, you're going to have blocking contention under the covers for your threads. Your SRE approach on prod, and uh, these are a couple of things I've learned that are very helpful for prod. As senior engineers, no matter what you've done, no matter how diligent you've been in your design and your build and your testing, stuff will have slipped through into prod that you didn't see coming, unintentional stuff. And uh, so pay attention in prod. The first one, and I've mentioned it numerous times, the raging herd. What's the so what of the raging herd? So first thing is protect yourself from the raging herd. And uh, by my experience, the classic way of doing that is your typical web server, your Apache web server, or your Nginx web server in front of you. These devices or um, components are brilliant at handling huge raging herds from browser community. They can establish quite literally millions of connections on the front of them and allow the load through onto your services in a controlled fashion. Second principle to tuck away is protect your downstreams from yourself as a raging herd. And the classic way there, as I said, is circuit breaker plus keep your pool sizes, connection pool sizes low. Next principle in prod. Production outages are your friend. As I said, stuff has slipped through that you didn't know. And I've found that paying attention to every small scale production outage, every incident, but vaguely sounds like it might be related to performance. Deeply analyze it. It's the veritable smoke before the, the typical huge fire that might catch you out. And it, they provide really great opportunities to analyze deeply, understand whether you've got a problem that could become a bigger problem and resolve them proactively. Next principle in prod, APM stands for Application Performance Monitoring. They are very specialized monitoring tools dealing with exactly what the name plate says. The common ones in the industry, the, the best of breed is uh, Dynatrace and Datadog, might be some of the ones you've heard of, Application Dynamics. It doesn't really matter which one you've chosen, but you have to have one. You're not going to scale your production system to very high loads without one of these, and you have to live by it. It's, uh, it, they really are exceptionally powerful tools to give you a little bit of insight into some of what they can do. Up on the screen here, this is out of the box. They self-discovery. Um, they get installed largely without your help. And it will plot out your entire complex server-side infrastructure for you. It'll link up all of the comms between those itself, applying all sorts of uh, AI logic nowadays and give you a view of actually how your production system's behaving and where those typical hotspots are. It gives you deep insight into every service and what I call the golden metrics. Golden metrics are, are three of them. It comes down to your, your average load or your peak loads per service, your exception or error rate on every one of those services, and your average performance. And the great thing here is it gives it at a very, very fine-grained detail level for every single service, no matter where it's running, as well as all forms of aggregation of that up to higher levels, so up to a system, uh, global system views or subsystem views. And then it gives you the deep dive ability. This screenshot shows where quite literally every single request that comes in server-side gets recorded. You can see the performance of it. You can click on every instance of it, and it'll give you a pseudo stack trace view of every, just about every line of code that was executed in providing that service. And for every line of code um, that it's pulling out, it's giving you the performance of that line of code as well as the resource used. These are phenomenally powerful tools. You have to have one. Choose one of the good ones. So that's the principles in general. And so I suppose just to summarize uh, what I've said today, the first one is don't be like me. Don't learn through pain. Um, take some of this away. Tuck it away for when you are working on a system where you need to scale your services to very high load. Next principle, and tuck this one, one away too. Senior engineers, it is you. 95% of the time, it's going to be caused by you. Pay attention. Remember the two formulas that uh, help guide your focus, being the uh, inverse relationship, as well as the Pareto 80-20 principle, and then tuck all of these design principles away and uh, pay attention to them. Use your APM in production, 
and use those typical production problems in a small scale to deep dive into what the issues are.